Chapter 16 The world's worst magician was a liability. He spoke up when they needed him to be silent, and was silent when they needed his feedback. He constantly chased his hat whenever the wind blew it off his head, which was often. His flashy robes and jingling trinkets, handmade from branches and stones discovered along the way, made him a visible and audible target. Cram Grammy was rife with challenges as well, especially at night. His snoring was so oppressive that anyone in the area could be forgiven for thinking a maniac lumberjack was on the loose. Something had to be done. At a resting point, Vant pulled Ski aside. Hey, we're really pushing it with these two. How far until we reach the outskirts? Depends. We've got to get southwest, but nomad territory stretches for a hundred miles in that direction. Heading due west would mean half the time in danger, but it would triple the mileage of the entire trip. If we go that far west, we'll hit the cliffs. Right. We follow them south all the way from there. Vance's blood turned cold. We can't go that way. Why not? Because. He could not put it into words. He did not want to put it into words. Look, I have my reasons. Such as? We just can't go that way, you understand? Ski was visibly thrown by Vance's sudden bite. The only thing that I understand is that you're being a weirdo. I mean, more than usual. What's the deal, Pops? You said you would take me where I need to go. That was our arrangement. Right, but I never said you could pick the path. Vance scratched his stubble in frustration. He filled his lungs and opened his mouth to protest. But only an exhale came out. We have to get out of nomad territory. We have to. We barely survived one attack. We can't risk a second. We'd never walk away from it. No one's that lucky. Rancho's tribe isn't the only one out here, you know. And I promised myself I would never take the cliffs again unless I absolutely had to. Well, guess what, pal? Ski glanced over at Grammy and the magician, who were rubbing their calloused feet. You have to. She was right, and he knew it. While the verbal agreement never came out of his mouth... He managed to muster a reluctant nod. So, she set them on a course designed to circumvent unnecessary attention. She soon developed a sense for which routes would prove too challenging for her inexperienced companions. And finally, after weeks, their footsteps found a natural pace. The magician's desires to explore soon resolved to a discernible pattern, as if an internal clock dictated his wanderlust. And, on a hunch... Vant put Grammy in charge of the group's breaks. This somehow extended the out-of-shape con man's stamina and energized him through a primordial desire to show off. They soon fell into a rhythm and were at last making good time. The extra mileage added to their trip was a daunting prospect, but the upside to leaving nomad territory was a freedom to converse and the ability to camp in more pleasant conditions. They risked small pleasures, such as admiring the landscape, sharing stories about their lives, and singing songs from their hometowns. Vant and Ski, both of whom had lived at various times in Land Escape, knew similar tunes, mostly children's songs, though Vant refused to join in. Grammys and the magician's hymns from Crashtown, however, skirted the edge of sensible taste. I dream of my maiden so fair With her lush flowing mane of long hair It gleams like a mare's And it's strong like a bear's It's too Too bad bad all that that hair hair is down there Occasionally, the magician soloed. The verses were nonsensical, but magnificent, decorated in resounding melodies from seasoned vocal cords. When he sang, the party would fall silent, knowing the treat could stop at any time, for any reason, interrupted by the tiniest of stimuli. Vant grew quieter the farther they got into the outskirts. The familiar topography had triggered a perpetual meandering inside his head, something that was cryptic to the others. Ski often tried to break him from the spells of introspection, at first just calling him Pops did the trick, a teasing reference to their first meeting when Vant believed he was her father. She had yet to let him live that down. But eventually, the effect wore off. Next, she took to placating his ego by asking his expertise on subjects in which he was well-versed. It worked for a time, but his manner soon turned even more distant. Finally, she resorted to a basic recurring check-in to see if he was okay. He always said he was fine, but he wasn't. 
His ice-cold demeanor over time completely chilled the rest of the group. They grew hesitant to speak with him. Soon, however, Ski had to. We're approaching the basin. We'll go around it. Through it. What is with this guy? She asked the others. Then she turned back to Vant. I can't figure you out. Stop being crazy. The basin is safe. The nomads keep away from it. Let's go through it, then we'll head due west. The nomads keep away from it because everyone keeps away from it. It's not the nomads that I'm worried about. There are way worse things in there. We can't take the cliffs. And we can't go through the basin. Grammy and W will never make it out alive. I can't be any clearer than that, Vant. She called him Vant, not Pops. It sounded off the way she said it, like it was not his real name. She added, Unless you have a damn good reason for putting us all at risk, we are going around it. He had a damn good reason. Speak now, or forever hold your peace. He said nothing. Ski took point, going the way she wanted to go. Grammy and the magician trailed behind. Vant followed them, slowly, but he followed. Ski led them to a hidden trail angling slowly but steadily upward. It was skinny, winding to the west and hugging the mountainside. Soon a serrated cliff appeared to the right, dropping into a gully of jagged rocks and boulders. They carefully traversed the lip. At peak elevation the terrain leveled off, and to the east the forestry melted away. A gradual slope cascaded into a valley. Look. She, Grammy, Vant, and the magician stood in reticent awe of the view before them. An ancient rotting city stretched for hundreds of miles through the basin below. A marsh, like a mossy lake, enveloped its base and crawled up the rusted skeletons of skyscrapers. Outcroppings of infrastructure in the final stages of biodegradation protruded from pockets of wetland, as if clawing their way out of quicksand. Patches of bog coiled in organized spirals, evidence of what had once been highways running between the crumbling structures. The forgotten metropolis was being swallowed by time. It was losing a battle against nature and being reclaimed by the earth. The landscape told the story of the world that used to be before the shift. A nuclear bomb had gone off but there had been no explosion. The bomb that was dropped was free energy, distributed by corpo, power in the form of corpo cells, and sustenance in the form of corpo capsules was provided free to all. The result of these baseline human needs being met was a shockwave sent around the globe. Faith was no longer needed. Theologies disintegrated lost from the temporal nature of the objects that had recorded their views. Industry was replaced by bots, and global commerce was rendered obsolete. Corpo soon handled it all, and when it did, everything changed. Everything. With unlimited energy at everyone's fingertips, the burden of carving out a living had fallen away. The concept of individual purpose based upon skill set had been reset. Governments only perpetuated outdated systems and served no further purpose. The very foundations that organized society had been built upon had been eradicated, which led to an Armageddon. Freedom had been the apocalypse. People of like minds banded together created new ideologies and turned insular against the outside world. They holed up in sanctuaries, townships, and became rigid in their beliefs, dogmatic, and they toiled away at whatever they believed could extend their lives. In the age of plentitude, life extension became the last great commodity worth chasing. But those who resisted the shift Those who clung to their old ways, defended their status, upheld their superiority, and coveted their now obsolete symbols of wealth. They were executed. Executed 
by the Knights of Rights and Vant Huel. Vant tore himself away from the view, wishing he could also tear himself away from the part he had played in the shift. They traveled south for two more days, letting the cliffs be their guide. They skirted the edge of the dramatic drop-off until they reached a hollow of flatland. The trees had been cut. The grass was patchy. People had lived there at one time. Ski, with great courage, disrupted Vance's impenetrable silence by asking, What is this place? He answered her by leading the group across a field and to a cave carved into the hillside. They entered. The floor was encased in a layer of dark crimson. In the center was an anvil, unyielding, unmovable. It was a reminder of the cave's prior purpose as the arms cache for the Knights of Rights. Awful things happened here, didn't they? A surge of vehemence rose up from the crimson on the floor, entered Vance's legs, passed through his groin and overfilled his gut. His heart began pulling apart, thread by thread, artery by artery, muscle by muscle. He wrapped his arms around his chest and squeezed. Not to comfort himself, to crush himself. He was losing his grip. He had to get out of the cave. He summoned enough strength to blow past his friends. Outside lay a lush green country, full of rolling hills. And upon a small hill, there was a stone, a black stone, worn and crumbling. Vance stood before it. His knees buckled. He hit the dirt. His head sank into the grass. His hands clasped the grave of his dearest friend. 